Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and we start with question number one from Joanne Lamond. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to figures published in the Scottish out-of-hospital cardiac arrest data linkage pro project, which suggests that people in the most deprived areas are 43% less likely to survive an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest than those living in more affluent areas. Minister Eileen Campbell. Thank you. Reducing inequalities and survival is a priority aim across the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest strategy for Scotland. We know that encouraging bystanders to give CPR is where maximum impact on survival will be achieved. That's why the Save a Life for Scotland campaign was launched in 2015 to encourage people to learn CPR and raise awareness of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Save a Life for Scotland partners are working with multiply deprived communities across Scotland. The HCA data linkage project supported by the Scottish Government is an integral to monitor the impact of the strategy. It will improve the understanding of the link between deprivation and survival to provide robust evidence for effective action. Joanne Lavin. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? The Minister may be aware that according to St Andrew's First Aid, survival rates from an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest sit at 68%, uh, lower than the European average of around 10%. That in itself must demand action. But someone who lives in a disadvantaged community is already more likely to have a heart attack. The fact that someone who has a heart attack in a disadvantaged community is, as is far more likely then to die because they've been unable to get the first age which, might, age which might save their lives is an utter scandal. What steps will the minister take to address this ultimate example of a postcode lottery? And will she meet with me to see how we might draw on the expertise of St Andrew's First Aid and other groups committed to giving people first aid skills in order to ensure that people in our Dubai communities have a better chance of survival? Minister. And I, I would absolutely um, be uh, happy to have a meeting with uh, Joanne uh, Lamont. I know that she takes a keen interest in this uh, area. I know that she's uh, publicly uh, talked about this uh, for many, many times. So absolutely we'll commit to having a meeting with her. And, and she's right, we need to try and make sure that we reduce inequalities. And that's why this, um, this information is important. It allows us then to concentrate on where we can have effective impact on our future actions. There is a specific look at inequalities throughout the strategy. That's why we're continuing to uh, move forward with our strategy to continue to increase the number of people who are able to give CPR, those bystanders who are able to help prevent a uh, loss of life. That's why we'll continue to focus our efforts on those areas. That's why we have the, the target of 500,000 people by 2020 being able to um, uh, give CPR and why we're pleased that we've got 200,000 people already able to provide CPR. So there's lots of action that we're taking forward. The information though is cr cr critical to enable us to kind of work out where we need to uh, help reduce these inequalities. And again, happy to meet with Joanne Lamont to explore what more we can do and her uh, keen interest in this to help us uh, inform our way forward. And Kenneth Gibson. <coughs> Thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister confirm that one reason for lower survival rates in the most deprived communities is that people are generally in poorer health and in the le less deprived, not least because of higher consumption of alcohol, uh, uh, tobacco and a poorer diet and that the way to improve survival rates is primarily to focus on improving the general health of people in our deprived communities to reduce the likelihood of cardiac arrest in the first place and she can she confirm that anyone regardless of where they come from uh, who's treated by the NHS receives exactly the same level of care regardless. Minister. Um, absolutely. Um, some of the issues around inequalities are absolutely linked to poor health, um, and those inequalities are a symptom. And those, that poor health is a symptom of wider uh, income inequalities. That's why we're taking action on a wide number of front fronts. We're looking to uh, end poverty. We're creating a uh, better support for families. We're continuing with our affordable housing, providing free school meals, a whole host of areas to help improve health. That's also why we're um, refreshing our alcohol strategy. We're looking to reduce smoking rates, we're looking to encourage active lives and healthier eating. So all of that uh, is around trying to tackle those ingrained inequalities to make sure that people don't suffer uh, that, uh, that postcode lottery that others found around their health and their wellbeing conditions. And that's why we'll continue to work to, to mitigate the uh, impact of UK government welfare cuts, which is also an has an impact on people's health and wellbeing and continue to focus in using the information that we've got through this data linkage work to work out how we can reduce those inequalities even further around the uh, rollout of CPR. Question number two, Andy Whiteman. 
Can I to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve the energy efficiency of existing homes? Uh, Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Over the next 15 to 20 years, uh, we will transform the energy efficiency of the nation's homes through Scotland's energy efficiency programme, building on the significant progress we have made to date. Uh, we are currently making ava available half a billion pounds over four years, and by the end of 2021, uh, we'll have allocated over a billion pounds since 2009 on tackling fuel poverty and improving energy efficiency. Uh, registered social landlords are making good progress in meeting the energy efficiency standard for social housing by 2020, and we're working with them to consider long-term milestones, and we remain committed to introducing energy efficiency standards in the private rented sector following the consultation on that earlier this year. Next year, we'll publish a route map for Scotland's energy efficiency programme, setting out our long-term ambition for the programme and the steps we will take to achieve it. Within this route map, we will set out our approach to energy efficiency standards in all homes. Andy Whiteman. I thank the Minister for that answer. It's now two years since the Scottish Government designated energy efficiency as a national infrastructure priority. Can the Minister say why energy efficiency spending has actually gone down since then? And can the Minister explain why last week's fuel poverty statistics show there's still over a million homes that fall short of the EPC rating C recommended by the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence. And can the Minister also tell us what practical measures will be in the upcoming Warm Homes Bill that will make energy efficiency a national infrastructure priority in relation to existing homes, both rented and owned? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, the uh, Warms Homes Bill and the uh, route map for Scotland's energy efficiency programme uh, will set out in depth uh, our ambitions for energy efficiency across all uh, tenures. Um, uh, I'm sure that Mr Whiteman uh, will be happy about certain aspects of uh, last week's figures, uh, particularly the ones that uh, uh, show that there are 100,000 fewer households in Scotland out of fuel poverty. Um, that is a, a good start. Uh, we have ambitions uh, to ensure that even more of Scotland's people are, are taken out of fuel poverty. And of course, our ambition is to uh, eradicate um, fuel poverty in the future. Some of uh, that uh, conditions are out with our control. Uh, fuel prices uh, still remain uh, uh, in the control of the Westminster government, and I hope that they will take action. But I can assure Mr Whiteman uh, that the Warm Homes Bill and our route map uh, for Scotland's energy efficiency programme uh, will uh, do much to improve energy efficiency across all tenures uh, here in Scotland. Graham Simpson. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Last week we heard that 26.5% of households are now in fuel poverty. That's a welcome reduction of 4% from the previous year. But the Scottish Government was supposed to have eradicated fuel poverty by November last year. And now the consultation on a new fuel poverty strategy suggests the government intends to set a target to have fewer than 10% of households in fuel poverty by 2040. So how many more winters will people in Scotland have to endure before this government eradicates fuel poverty? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Well, if we didn't have to endure a Tory government uh, with its policies of austerity, uh, then we could be doing much better. The fact that Social Security uh, has been cut to many households, including households in work, uh, adds to the woes. Uh, and beyond that, um, the UK government said that they would take action on fuel prices uh, and have failed to do so. Uh, maybe uh, Mr Simpson would be best placed to talk to his colleagues south of the border to get them to act in a reasonable manner, to get rid of austerity, to put a cap on fuel prices and then we might be in a better position here in Scotland. Yeah. Question number three, Claire Hockey. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I refer members to my register of interests as a registered mental health nurse who holds an honorary contract with Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to attract more people to train as nurses. Cabinet Secretary Sheila Robinson. Last week, the Chief Nursing Officer for Scotland published a report on widening participation into nursing and midwifery education and careers. 
The report recommends a range of measures to attract people into nursing, including a national campaign to recruit a more diverse workforce and tackle negative stereotypes and more flexible routes, routes into education. This report was launched in the same week we saw the highest ever number of acceptances to nursing and midwifery courses at our universities. The action set out will allow us to build on that, maximising the opportunities available and the people who can benefit from them. Claire Hawkey. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Last year, the UK government scrapped bursaries for student nurses and introduced fees. Since then, there has been an 18% reduction in applications from nursing students. Both the Royal College of Nursing and the President of Universities UK attribute this in part to the withdrawal of bursary funding. In contrast, recent UCAS statistics show an increase of 8% of students enrolling at Scottish universities to train as nurses. Can the Cabinet Secretary reassure people in Scotland who want to train as nurses that this government will continue to support them in this essential profession and will not withdraw bursary funding? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, I absolutely can, and I think the UCAS statistics tell a, a very interesting story uh, of uh, the position here in Scotland compared to south of the, the border. We continue to protect the non-means-tested, non-repayable nursing and midwifery student bursary and, of course, free tuition, which is in stark contrast to the UK government, who scrapped both in England, resulting in the dire consequences that the member describes. We have also increased support for students most in need or facing financial hardship and will continue to review the support package to ensure that nursing and midwifery students receive the support that they need. In particular, we'll consider whether additional support is needed for students in remote or rural areas or from low-income households. Question number four, Jenny Gilruth to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on Transport Scotland's plans for road safety improvements on the A92. Minister Hamza Youssef. We are committed to improving safety on our trunk roads, including, of course, the A92, where we have been working closely with the communities and, of course, local elected members. We have invested over £35.1 million on the A92 since 2007 to ensure it continues to operate safely and efficiently. A number of studies are underway and are planned, which will identify further improvements that can be made. This will build on the investment that has already been undertaken in recent years, which includes works at a number of junctions, as well as providing pede better pedestrian facilities at Gillenrothes and Forgan to Teabridge. Jenny Gilruth. I thank the Minister for that response. Uh, the Minister will be aware that tomorrow I will be leading a walk along the five hazards of the A92. Earlier this year, he agreed with campaigners to visit the road himself. Is it still his intention to do so? And can he provide me with a reassurance as a constituency MSP that improving road safety on the A92 is of paramount importance to the government? Minister. I can wish the member well uh, for the walk that she's doing on the five hazards, as it's called, of the A92. I will be looking forward to hearing uh, an update and some feedback uh, from her. As the member rightly says uh, in her question, she knows that we've met with the community councils, uh, other community stakeholders, uh, and of course elected members. And can I thank her uh, for the pressure that she's exerted uh, on this important issue around the A92. As I said in my previous answer, there are a number of studies underway. Uh, I know Transport Scotland last met with the Community Council uh, earlier this year in August. Uh, they promised on the back of all the conflict studies which are being done, the traffic studies and the various other pieces of work, they would report back early next year. And can I say absolutely, it's my intention, of course, uh, to visit the A92, which I'll do in conjunction uh, with, the, with, the, with the member's office. Question number five, Maurice Corrie. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to develop restorative justice. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Following on from the publication of guidance for the delivery of restorative justice in Scotland on the 13th of October 2017, we will consult on an order under Section 52 of the Victims and Witnesses Act 2014 to prescribe who must have regard to the guidance. We will also work closely with Justice and Third Sector partners to ensure access to existing services and to develop further provision to meet the needs of victims. Maurice Corey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, experts are clear that restorative justice empowers victims and cuts reoffending. I welcome the guidance that has been published, but the fact is there is simply not enough practitioners out there to use it. Victims deserve the chance to get an explanation from, from the person who commits the harm and when will the Scottish Government make this the norm rather than the exception? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, I do uh, agree with the Member that uh, restorative justice can be an effective tool in the right circumstances. 
Um, what we're doing just now is we are presently uh, taking forward some work with Community Justice Scotland to identify the areas in Scotland where restorative justice is presently taking place because a number of local authorities already deliver restorative justice programmes and to identify where there are gaps in different parts of other local authorities that don't presently provide restorative justice to then consider what measures can be taken in order to support them in delivering restorative justice programmes. I recognise the value that can come from restorative justice, both for those who are the, uh, uh, those who have caused harm and also for those who are victims of crime. Uh, and I want to make sure there's a greater consistency of approach across the country. The guidance will assist us in achieving that and the work we're now taking forward with Community Justice Scotland will assist us in identifying areas where we need to make further progress. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree it must be up to the victim of a crime if they want to engage in restorative justice practices and that the necessary support must be in place for them throughout this process? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so also, I do agree with that. It's extremely important that uh, the, uh, both the victim and also those who have caused harm uh, are participating in the programme on a voluntary basis because that's one of the key benefits uh, that drive the system. The new guidance which we've issued uh, highlights that that's a, a key aspect of how we want to see restorative justice uh, being taken forward. Alongside that, those who are participating in restorative justice also have to be assisted by those who are appropriately trained to deliver restorative justice programmes in order to provide the appropriate support and assistance that's required as they go through that process. Lee MacArthur. Thank you very much. Can I too welcome the publication of the guidance in October following the commitment uh, secured by the Liberal Democrats in 2013? But can the Cabinet Secretary provide a little more detail uh, on the steps to be taken uh, to support community safety groups such as SACRO and others to act as facilitators uh, in the restorative justice process? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the member may be aware that SACRO is one of the organisations that's on the Restorative Justice Forum. Uh, that helped to uh, draft the guidance which we issued in October. Uh, one of the uh, important elements we need to take forward before we uh, decide on what our future approach to restorative justice should be is to identify the areas of good practice that's already taking place in a number of local authority areas in Scotland and to identify where there are gaps and then to consider what's the most appropriate approach in taking forward further restorative justice programmes in Scotland. That may come in the form of a national strategy to help to inform that at a local uh, level, but we want to identify where the gaps are first in order to then consider what would be the most appropriate mechanism for taking forward further restorative justice programmes in Scotland uh, as we move forward. Question number six, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action is being taken to improve facilities at HM Prison Dumfries to meet the needs of older prisoners. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Prison Service has been actively considering their approach to population management. Older people are one of the population groups being looked at. If an older person is admitted to prison with specific needs, an individual care plan, care package and accommodation adjustments will be put in place following consultation with the necessary multi-agency partners. Older people with mobility issues are located in a specific area of HMP Dumfries. Dis disabled access ramps have been put in place in this area to aid accessibility and additional minor modifications are carried out to meet the needs of individual prisoners when required. Colin Smith. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The need to improve facilities for, for older prisoners was highlighted in the Chief Inspector of Prisons report, Who Cares? Now, given the, this explanation and given the, the need to improve facilities, can the Cabinet Secretary explain why Dumfries was not included in the most recent estate development programme, raising understandable concerns from staff about the future of the prison? Can the Cabinet Secretary give an assurance that bringing the prison up to a standard that is reasonable will definitely be included in the next phase of that programme? And given the integration of health and social care, can the Cabinet Secretary say whether he intends to revisit the lack of health and social care integration in prisons, where health boards are responsible for health care in prisons, but the prison service remains responsible for social care? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, officer, the member may misunderstand the approach that has been taken forward by the Scottish Prison Service in meeting the needs of older prisoners within the prison estate. It has been taken forward as part of the prisoner population management programme rather than actually by a prisoner segment group uh, of older prisoners. And that's meant that they have taken into account the evidence that's come from Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Prisons uh, in the Who Care report that he made reference to. 
uh, and they're taking a dispersal model, which means that they are providing access to facilities across all of the prison estate rather than to a specific establishment. And that includes uh, HMP uh, Dumfries. The member made, then made reference to the issue of the capital investment programme that's been taken forward by the Scottish Prison Service. That's been taken forward on a phased basis, uh, which has saw significant capital investment made in the creation of new establishments and upgrading existing establishments. The, uh, the present stage of that is looking at HMP Inverness and also HMP, uh, HMP uh, Berlini and also HMP uh, Greenock and looking at how they will be developed going forward and that the next phase of that will then be for HMP Dumfries and for HMP uh, Open Estate at Castle Huntley and they will then look at how they will phase that programme moving forward. In relation to the issue of uh, pay, uh, prisoner health care, uh, that's an area which has now been progressed uh, with the partnership that's been de developed between the Scottish Prison Service and individual health boards in each prison area. And in order to support that at a national level, we've established the Health and Justice uh, Collaboration Improvement Board in order to make sure that prisoner health care is driven forward right across all of the prison estates and also in the health boards that have a responsibility. And one of its key priorities is to make sure that we improve prisoner health care overall. And that work stream will be taken forward in the coming months. Thank you for that very detailed answer. We that concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson.